Hi, right, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday, August 18th meeting of the High Point City High Point Public Safety Committee. I am Victor Jones, Chairman. I'm here along with Councilman Chris Williams. Uh, Councilman uh, Mayor Pro Tem Britt Moore could not be here, and Councilman Johnson could not be here. Our first uh, item on the agenda will be item 2021-379, presentation on the city hotspots, crimes in the city. Uh, we have our police chief uh, Stroud here with us to present. Mm -hmm. Can I take the mask off? To the sure. I think I picked it. Appreciate you having me. As requested, what will be on the screen, I'm going to jump back and forth between this PowerPoint and some other PDFs just to give you a better view. A lot of it, this, the, whatever's in the PDFs is in the PowerPoint. You can just see it better on the PDFs. It gets a little bit blurry when you put it in the PowerPoint, but I'll try and explain as we go through. Uh, as requested, what we did, I had our crime analyst go through and pull our top three hotspots from year to date 2021 to now. Um, so we'll go reach one of those. Um, our first one is gonna be North Main Street in the Hartley Drive area, and I got the blocks registered out there, 2,600 to 3,000. Number two is gonna be your East Green Drive area, University. And our boundaries we use for that one are gonna be Centennial, MLK, Brentwood, and Kearns, to give you an idea of the quadrant that we're dealing with. And then our third one is gonna be South Main Street near Fairfield, and pretty much primarily the 2,600 block of South Main Street. Uh, the next one you're going to see is just a big old map of High Point. Um, I know it looks a little bit convoluted in there, but if you follow along up at the top yellow spot, that is North Main Street going toward 311, and we'll work our way down. That's our number one hot spot. If you work our way down to the middle, where you can see that small little yellow area off to the right near Lamb and New, that's our number two spot. And as you go further south, that last hot spot is 2600 block of South Main Street. So it runs just right down the Main Street corridor. Really no surprise to us when we pulled the data that those are our three top hot spots. Uh, but I'll sort of go into why each one of those is a hot spot as we get into each of these slides. Um, and I'll bet as we run through the years, if we went back to 2020, 2019, 18, I'll bet it's about the same one every single time. All right, the first one, North Main Street at Hartley. Again, we're dealing with the 2600 block of Maine to about the 3,000 block of North Main Street. I pulled up the aerial map in there. You can see what's in that block. Clearly, Walmart is going to be a major player for us. The food line across the street. you got your big box stores right there uh, in 2,600 block of North Main with Lowe's. And I even went and looked at data a little further up the road at the 2,300 block at Home Depot. They seem to be a driver for us as well. I mean, I'm here during the day, so I listen to the radio quite a bit. And both those addresses, the big box stores are going out a lot. Uh, with Walmart. Clearly at the top, as you can see, we've answered 473 calls at Walmart just this year. Um, Lowe's had 109, Home Depot 133, the food line across the street from Walmart 125. And then up there to drive also in a lot of our data is that intersection at North Main Street at Hartley. That's one of our top 10 crash intersections inside the city. So it's going to push us there quite a bit to drive up the data in that little area. Um, on the left part of the screen that you're looking at, you'll see how we pulled out the stats and sort of broken them down. All the ones that you see in, highlighted in white are a property crime, and all the ones that are highlighted in yellow are a violent crime. The, all of them are going to be impact crimes for our stats that we report every single year, but yellow is violent and white is going to be the property crimes. So you can see, I mean, what's driving us in that area, in that corridor, is probably our top, what, five things are dealing with strictly property stuff. We get a lot of thefts out there. Clearly, when you're running to the Walmart that much, I'm not just trying to single out Walmart. That's not a purpose here. But when you're going there that much, we're going to answer a lot of larceny calls in there. And Chief, plus, those are the box sorry. stores. Yes, did sir. You, did you say larceny, all other, that's, that's property too? Yes. Okay, that is. Okay. Yes. It won't involve any person being the victim. If a person is the victim, physically the victim, it'll be in one of the other ones, like a strong arm robbery, a firearm, something like that. We don't really have that much of that up there. I mean, we really don't. I mean, you can see the numbers are lower. Um, those could, some of those could be very, very simplistic things. We do have some, 
uh, I, won't call them, I don't want to call them transient, but some of our homeless folks that congregate around there, and a lot of our person's crimes drive off of them. Approaching people, depending on how they approach, some of that aggressive panhandling could move into this. Uh, one of our latest calls at Lowe's was our guy was assaulted at the ATM in front of, of Lowe's. Uh, we had a guy pull up, and this is an older gentleman out there, and taking out money, uh, crime of opportunity, and took advantage of it. But luckily, we were able to make an arrest in that case after a, a brief foot chase and everything. But that's what we're sort of dealing with up in this area. So that data does not surprise me, even in the slightest. Uh, when they pulled it, there was no surprises there. The only thing that is not included in there is all of our traffic stuff. I asked them not to pull that in. That's sort of a citywide thing for us. Uh, but that is going to be a high traffic intersection with a lot of accidents. Plus, all the ones we get in the parking lots up there, too, would drive those numbers through the roof. And I couldn't even put them on the screen, the amount of traffic stuff we pull in up there. These are calls, but are these successful arrests, too? Some. Yeah, as you can see, a lot of the ones over here on the left, those are calls that we get, but I can't answer for every one that we make a case in. There's absolutely, we're not 100%, I can tell right. you that. Uh, there's no way. Now, a lot of our violent crimes, yes, we've had a lot of success this year in making the arrest. The larcenies, a lot tougher. Uh, there, a lot of times those folks are gone before we can get there. We have to rely on video, uh, face recognition, and stuff like that. There are our guys identify them. We put them out department-wide. So not as much luck on the, on the property crime stuff as we do the uh, violent crime. But if we're going to make an arrest and make a case, I want it to be on the person's crimes before the property. Our people come first. Uh, moving on to number two, our East Green Drive and University area. Again, use these boundaries of Centennial, Brentwood, MLK, and Kearns as your, your guide for you. And as you can see at the map on the left, um, a lot of that is going to be a big residential area. All that stuff you see in green where it cuts down there in the middle uh, from University to the right, if you're looking up north, is all going to be residential. And to the left, we have more, I wouldn't say commercial because that's not what it is. But it also in this... Some of the data in this box can be a little bit deceiving. We do generate a lot of calls at the police department. We're right in the middle of it. So anytime we have someone walk in the door, that may be the signal one or the initiation location for it. Unless we change the address in our system, it's still going to show up as 1009 Leonard Avenue. You also have the courthouse, the mental health building, and the magistrate all over here at 505 East Green. So clearly that's going to be a big time source for us. We go there consistently every single day to serve warrants. Uh, we pull people out of court who have warrants. We do all kinds of stuff over there. So that's going to be a big driver as well. But the biggest spot that we have for the commercial side is Apple Tree Grocery. We get a lot of stuff down there at the 1100 block of East Green. Um, but as you can see in the block on the right, pulling out the data, again, our top ones over there are still going to be property related, but the uptick in the violent crime dealing with people as being the victims is much, much greater. I mean, you're looking at all other shootings in there. It's a lot of our drive-bys and things like that, 23 of them. Uh, assaults with guns, 17. That's, that's 40 calls right there alone. Uh, and that's just what's being reported to us or what we self-initiate in there. So I'm not can only imagine if we're not getting reported. But I will tell you, on a positive note, those numbers are much lower than our years past. 2020, 2019, 2018, all those numbers are down right now. And, and I'm thankful for that, now, whether that's you know, change in mindset, our proactive enforcement that we've been trying to do. And we really do concentrate a big portion of our enforcement effort in this area to help drive that stuff down for those citizens who live there. They don't need to be subjected to this. That's all it comes down to. Uh, so we try to focus efforts on there through our people, uh, cars and guns philosophy. We'll focus on the right people. We're going to stop people from motor vehicle violations, reasonable suspicion, probable cause, that's what you get. And we're going to pull as many illegal guns off the streets as we can. And we get a significant amount from this area. And we do. So number two, again, this is not a surprise that this is a hot spot for us. Um, if it wasn't for the big box stuff on Main Street, this would probably pull number one, I would guess. And then our last one, as you move further down Main Street, our South Main and Fairfield area, 2600 block of South Main, Again, I hate to keep singling out any business, but when you got Walmart down there, we are consistently running back and forth on a daily basis. The address is pretty, uh, pretty regular on the radio, day and night. Um, we could probably put a substation down there sometimes and still won't be able to answer all the calls. It's just the way it is. We've got to run back and forth to the mattress office. But you can see on the left, the, near, the numbers are going to pretty much mirror the North Main Street stuff. Uh, it's going to be property-related out of the get. 
um, with our top four up there, all being larceny in some form or fashion. Uh, we don't have as many, as you can see, persons, violent crimes down there. Those numbers are very, very low, which is was great. We like that. Uh, still too many. But clearly it's a, it's a property, larceny-driven hotspot for us. That's all there is to it. And it runs up and down that South Main Street corridor. We have some other spots in there. You've got a lot of businesses uh, right there. And then you also have that South Main and Fairfield intersection, which is all since I've been here since 19... 95 has been a top 10 crash intersection. It's just a huge intersection. Mm -hmm. It's big. A lot of moving parts that go in there, and we have a ton of wrecks down there. It doesn't matter what kind of enforcement we're going to do. We're still going to have wrecks. It's just so big. You're, just gonna, you're bound to have accidents and that volume of traffic. So, again, not a surprising that that comes in number three. Moving along. Again, map of the city. I know it looks very convoluted and things like that. In addition, on this map is what you see is all those little dots. At the last slide, I can tell you what all those little dots mean, whether it mean an aggravated assault, uh, the green stars mean homicides. All these are our impact violent crimes throughout the city. I know this is not exactly what we asked for in the hot spots, but I think it's very, very relevant for what we're talking about. Um, so as you can see, we got a spattering of violent crime that happens all over the city, even on the north side of Premier Drive. They're, no, they're not immune to it. But you can see a heavy, heavy concentration right there in the middle um, in that East Green University hotspot area, which was number two in the rankings. Um, I specifically pulled up the map to circle it in there, and you can see the clusters that we get in that little spot. This should help people understand why we try to do so much enforcement down there to try to pervert, to, to deter and prevent down there. And I, you know, I can only imagine if we weren't there as much as we were, what the numbers could, could be. So our people are doing the right things. We're concentrating in the right efforts. But again, I mean, I'm not in love with all the numbers. I'm glad they're lower, but of course, you know, I'm going to push the gas pedal to get lower every single time. That's what we're looking for. Uh, but again, this is going to be a high concentration area for us. And if we can, you know, keep battling this and make a little bit of a, a move, we'll hopefully, you know, make a difference down there in that neighborhood. But it's been a consistent issue for many, many years. It's not like this is an aberration this year or anything next. And then there's those, if you look at the maps, the two things, all the dots. That's what every one of them comes down to. You can get hold of the PowerPoint. I can send it to you, the PDF, so you can look across your map, see what's in your area specifically or anyone else. So, uh, but there's you know, quite a bit going on throughout the city. We just happen to have a heavy concentration in that East Green and University area. So questions? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, this is uh, Councilman Williams. Uh, could you go back just really quick to the um, Hotspot slides. I, I just wanted to check something real quick. That one. Uh, actually, go to the the first the first hotspot slide. Yeah, with your um, stats on it. Okay, and then go to the second one. All right. Is that the only slide that has like the homicides in it? Ye probably the last one. Uh, we, I don't know if they actually specifically pulled them all over the place. We don't have a high concentration of our homicides in any one area this year, which is awesome. Which is what I was exactly. Trying to, trying I mean, to if you let me go to the last map, as you can that. see, I, the green stars, mm. they're all over the place. We don't have a huge concentration clustered up as we have had in years past. That's why it's, we have 13 homicides on the year, and is truly an anomaly because it's very hard for us to get in front of it because the predictability is is at zero. I mean, our last one was out on 2900 block of West English Road. Um, you know, a juvenile shooting another juvenile. Um, we had never contacted them before. Those were tough to get in front of. Right. Um, and then it doesn't help us any that it was reported for six to eight hours later after it actually happened. That doesn't help us any. But we were able to make an arrest in it. You know, we're 12 or 13 on our arrest right now. The only one we have open is 3 or 4 Ardale. Um, and we're making not much headway on that, I'll be mm -hmm. honest. I just I, I kind of noticed that we were talking about like you, you, you got your clusters even in uh, looks like the East Central area still not all the homicides that are there a lot of shootings but not the homicides so um, which is good and we'll take that I think it's probably what you were noticing because if we'd have shown this in years past Councilman Williams you know there had been a lot more in there that's yeah. not the case this year so I'm happy yeah. I'm not in love with any of the homicides but I'm happy that they're not clustered either true what are we seeing you know illegal drugs or stuff like that, are they, do those pretty much correlate to similar hotspots? Well, not in those hotspots. 
Uh, number one and number three, no, I don't think that's the, a direct drug connection. Now, you may have a lot of the larceny stuff that ties into a drug connection on a secondary level, meaning I'm stealing to front for my addiction. That could be part of the case. I, I don't know that, depending on how many arrests we make and what we can get in our interviews and things like that and how truthful people are when we do interview them. But I can't say those first two connect with the larcenies. Now, I would say a lot more of our stuff down there in that B2 area, the University in Green, yes, there's probably much more of a drug nexus in there with a lot of these crimes. Uh, because I will tell you, we still have it going on, our Vice Narcotics Unit, um, not just them, but our Street Crimes Unit and a lot of our proactive patrol guys are still pulling dope left and right. I mean, our numbers are pretty darn good for the year. Um, and we want to do that because we do think there is a direct connect with the drugs and those guns that we want. Every single time, we seem to get one or the other. So uh, it works out pretty good for us because we're taking that stuff off the street. So is that Monica? Some myths about those two hot spots is obviously that's where our two biggest homeless populations in the city are, North Mount Logan, North Main Walmart, and South Main Walmart. And yeah. Yeah. I'm pointing like you can see it up here with that laser thing. But yes, uh, Chief Reed is correct. Um, up behind is spattering but behind Walmart, move further north, even to the Old Plank area, uh, which they walk down every single day. As you, if you drive through there, you'll see them. That's a big concentration of it, especially at our 2970 interchange at South May. Uh, Tent City uh, comes and goes. But yes, that is a huge issue for us. They drive calls for service. Um, we have, on the negative side of it, while I do, I mean, I feel bad for folks in their situation, we've seen a much more aggressive approach for many of them, which is unacceptable. We have an aggressive solicitation city ordinance that we try to actively enforce. Um, there's a lot of criteria that's got to go in there to make it stick. We just got to make sure on the other end, when it gets to the court, that our prosecutors are seeing it as serious as we are, because I don't like it. I've openly said that before. I don't like our citizens being approached like that. It's a very nervous and scary moment for a lot of people, and I don't like seeing people scared. It's just what it comes down to. Uh, I understand, you know, people get in bad situations, and bam, and that's just, I hate that for them. I do, but that's not the way to do it. We've seen a much more aggressive approach from them. I know uh, one of the ladies that came in and spoke to Council Chambers, and Councilman Peters has also brought it up that there's some areas of the town that have like prostitution and mm -hmm. stuff going on in the southern parts of the town as well. Um, that would be even that third hotspot area, correct? Close, uh, somewhat. It wouldn't go up as far as Southside, what we call, we refer to as Southside, that the Flint Street area yeah. is specifically what we're talking about uh, with a lot of those complaints. It doesn't venture up quite there because we're just dealing with the 2600 block of South Main and you would have to move up to about the War Street area over there. Now, Willow, oh, Willow, since you bring up that area in Flint, uh, we have made more of a, a directed approach out there. Uh, myself and the assistant chiefs have all made sure we've been through there because we want to monitor the situation too. And I will tell you, I'm not saying that, that the, our callers or our complainants are wrong, but I have not seen that yet. Okay. I mean, now uh, we've gone through there several times. I want to get a gauge of exactly what we're doing. We're not talking about a huge geographic area, and I have not seen the complaints that we're dealing with. Now, you just look at the look of it. Do I see the potential for it? Absolutely. Absolutely, I do. And some of those things will alleviate. Uh, we're going to end up putting the radar signs up on Flint, which is probably, data's probably going to tell us that traffic's not the issue. That was one of the big complaints that we got when I personally spoke to her on the phone. Uh, but we'll let the data tell us if we need to do traffic enforcement down there, specifically on Flint, we will. And I know that the issue is bigger than Flint, but when I've been down there doing my checks, and I drive an unmarked, so you can't see me coming that well, uh, I have not seen any of the prostitution things, no open air drug stuff. Uh, no dogs running loose. That was a big complaint, too. That's a consistent complaint across that, that area anyway. So I have not personally seen it yet, but we're only talking about a small sample size of time, too. Right. Um, Chairman, may I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, were, were you just talking about Southside? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Because um, I was just going down there a couple weeks ago and saw the green. See, I, I went through there actually a couple times and spotted none. I had Major Gamble just go through there this today or yesterday, none. I mean, it's more than that, but there, there's no way there's a zero. Right. Don't, don't get my statements wrong. It's going on. They're just maybe a little smarter about it too. I mean, we're talking about people who've been doing this for quite a while. Um, and it's, it's gonna be, to combat this, there's no secrets. It's not a uniform patrol operation deal that you're gonna beat them with. You're gonna have to, we're gonna do some undercover work down there.
You know, after, after having been around here for a while and done two different stints in vice narcotics, which one of their, their jobs is, is going to be those kind of crimes or solicitation and stuff like that. You know, I have historically, just with my own eyes, the predominant is white females and a prostitution. I have not seen the connection with a pimp at all. It is more of an independent operator. I don't know if you call them that or not. Yeah. I don't know what the terminology is, but it is them driving their own business. I have not seen the pimp side of it. But to answer her other question, yes, historically, a lot of the Johns, if that's what you call it, yeah, white males. I think that I think that's an accurate description. You said Johns? Johns. Like the picking them up. Okay. The men picking up the females. I think they're majority white male. And that's just from my observations alone. Okay. Um, if you you good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Um, want to go back to um, a question that was asked by the chair um, when we were talking about the drugs. Is there a trend to the type? Is it still opiates high and then everything else afterwards? Yeah, I didn't bring the stats in with me. I could have told you exactly what we were seizing uh, to this point. Um, meth has seen a huge uptick quite a bit, which is scary because it's a dangerous and nasty drug. Uh, all of our heroin stuff is up. Marijuana is still big, while a lot of society does not see that as a problem. I can assure you it is. We have people that are getting killed over marijuana. Yeah. Therefore, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what the rest of society says. Until that stops, then I, I won't change my stance on it. What we're seeing less of, believe it or not, though, in very little minutes, is crack cocaine. That was big as I was coming up through the ranks. That's yep. all we arrested for. We never saw meth, never saw heroin. It was a rarity for us to get those two drugs, and now that's all we're getting. And then the other big grab is fentanyl. Uh, we're seeing a lot of fentanyl, which is very, very dangerous for our folks to get exposed to, but it's even more so, it's even more so for the general public because we're taking precautions. I mean, we're PPing up, PPing up and everything like that. We've got procedures. We won't even test, field test anymore. We had to yank that off the board. We have to send it off every single time. Now, um, but I can only imagine what the public's getting exposed to out there. But we seized a lot of fentanyl, too. When you say it's been a little bit on the rise, over what period of time are you talking about this year? Are you talking about the last three months? This year? Okay. I mean, I don't know what our data is from 2020, but I just pulled the numbers for the manager's meeting two weeks ago, I think that was it, and had all the numbers in there. And it showed the gram weight of what we pulled and the monetary value, the street value of those drugs, and it was quite a bit of, of everything other than cocaine. And what, I mean, are, are we successfully tr tracking down the, the dealers and the, distri the distributions that people well, that are. is that's a it's a good question what i want our vice and narcotics unit to do and it's not a huge unit i won't give you numbers because i don't ever like to give up the tactical side of it but sure. they're they're not a huge unit i want them to strictly concentrate on the mid to upper level stuff i mean we could nickel and dime all day long right. and not put a dent in anything uh, i don't ever know if we're going to stop you know, the supply versus the demand out there. But the point of the, that group working is we want those mid to upper level folks when they're working to constantly have their head on the swivel. They don't know when our guys are, and girls are coming. Uh, they don't know how we're going to come at them. They don't know who we're going to bring with us. We have a lot of federal partners that work with us as well, meaning DEA, ATF too, because guns are involved in this. So um, I want them concentrating on those mid to uppers. And I will tell you, if I had the data, I wish I'd have brought it with me. I just didn't think about it. Because um, it wasn't one, of the, wasn't one of our topics, but they're pulling enough dope to tell you, yes, they're coming after it. But at the same time, here's the problem we run into. When you grab one, there's another one ready to slide in because it's a money making operation. Sure. As long as you got the demand for that product, there's going to be somebody who's going to try and sell it, period. You know, that's the same thing with marijuana. People say legalize it and you'll take it away. No, you won't. It'll just be sold legally here and then the black market will bump the price up and we'll get it over here. That's just the way it works. So, same thing with guns. Um, so, I know like in the past few years, we, we talked about how, how many people would actually come from other cities because of, you know, what they heard or because we actually kept decent statistics in the city. So, they were coming here. Is that still an issue, high, or? It, it's it's still high. And, and what Councilman Williams is asking about is since 2014, when we were the heroin epidemic really really started and kicked off um again, i've told you we we caught on pretty early to this I and mean, i was the vice narcotics commander at the time and we didn't see met i mean we didn't see heroin at all up to this point 
In 2014, all of a sudden it hits the scene and we were like, eh, something's going on here. So we started tracking very, very early to see what was going on. Because again, we're data driven. We, we can pull a stat for everything. You, you name it, those two crime analysts over there, they put it in their stuff and they, they, get it, they get it out for you. So we started tracking early and we noticed that a lot of our arrests we were making were people from other cities like Lexington, Thomas, wherever. Didn't matter. Um, but as we track the data, I'd say we're sitting, and that's not changed throughout 2014, the, the number of out-of-towners coming in to buy dope is high. But I'll bet we're about a 65, 35 ratio in town being our offenders. But the market's also spread now so much. I bet the other cities are just as bad as we do. We have it. Um, the problem is this. Yeah. I mean, it's made, the, it's made the game so much harder to get to. It's not a location anymore. It's this. Um, it's, and it's mobile. It could be here one day, here the next. Uh, and we only have X amount of people, X amount of time in the day, uh, other than calls for service that we're getting, so which makes it much tougher. So when, the, when the, we moved out of the open air business and then out of the drug house business and into that, the mobile drug dealer, it made the game much, much harder for us. But that's why we use that people, cars, and guns philosophy. They have to drive that dope from A to B. They gotta obey traffic laws while they do it too. Because if they don't, then there's our stop. And we just have to follow the process of law to get the rest of it. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. I would think maybe uh, maybe as soon as our next public safety meeting, maybe we could look at the data that you were just referring to when it comes to the drugs and, and how efficient we are at, at uh, curbing that problem. We can. It'll be an interesting pull, too. I mean, it's probably one that we need to do on a regular basis so the public does know what uh, – you know what they're up against and what our officers detectives are doing because it's for a small unit they're pulling a lot of stuff i would love for it to be much more expansive department-wide but we're getting so many calls for service that even our proactive guys cannot find the time to go out and be proactive right now it's tough we're running from call to call to call to call um and it's the radio is working all day well, if, I, if i may sure. just want to add one more thing to maybe the the next public safety meeting. Can we talk about um, like your call for service, call for service to domestic violence? Um, has that has that lightened up? Because I know it went like kind of astronomical during the quarantines and COVID. And I know that since we kind of got out more, uh, I hope we keep doing that instead of having to go back in. But just in case, I just wanted to kind of get an idea to see if that trend we can. has reduced since then. We pulled DV numbers. Uh, we track them pretty hard. Um, we're especially going to be in tune to the ones we've already notified. We've gotten in front of them and told them they need to cease that stuff. You know, we, you know, historically that DV stuff is a behind the closed door activity you think is secretive, but there's signs. You just got to look, know what you're looking for. Um, but we can pull that stat data for you pretty easily. You know, I do know we've had 13 homicides this year, and I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I can replay every one of them. I think three, in my opinion, are DV related. That's that's a lot, in my opinion. I don't, I don't like them, so. Any other questions for the Chief? All right, well, Chief, I appreciate you. You got it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Give me a, Our uh, next item on the agenda be item 2021-380, and that's be an update on the code enforcement efforts of several local motels. Well, good afternoon. I'm going to give you a, just a brief overview of kind of where we're at in the one process that started um, in the winter of last year, 20, around 2020, uh, and there was a concerted effort at that point to identify some of our most problematic motel locations in the city. The police department at that time provided some statistics as to calls for service and the types of calls for service that we were experiencing at those locations. Um, the staff has looked at those over the years a number of times, and our top five locations continue to be the top five as far as um, issues that are have been identified um, as you're aware one of the issues that has repeatedly come up has been long-term stays at properties that are not zoned for long-term occupancy so that's residential use uh, of a hotel or motel uh, that's functioned more as an apartment so um, the the city staff uh, led by the fire marshal's office has the ability to inspect those properties uh, the fire marshal's office is in the midst of a program to visit all of our motel and hotel properties and is doing so and what we wanted to do today was report out 
after a period of time where we were not quite as aggressive as in going out and, and looking at some of those properties because of some of the sheltering provisions that were in place as it related to COVID, um, that enforcement has stepped back up. Uh, and one of the areas that we've uh, focused on lately is a, a property on West Green Street that you're familiar with. I think all of you are aware of that property. Um, Fire Marshal's office along with inspections and then code enforcement visited the, one of those properties this week um, and just wanted to note that there were a number of violations or several violations noted in those inspections um, and those included fire safety violations, structural concerns with the building or, or doors and then once those inspectors were there they noted that there were long-term uh, rentals or occupancy occurring at those properties so those type things will be addressed through notices of violation and they will come from both the fire marshal's office and also from our code enforcement staff um, what that do then does is it provides a 30-day notice to cure those violations and, and staff will be following up on those to make sure that they're uh, addressed or remedied uh, one of the, the the property there also has a structure which was formerly a restaurant um, that has a current notice of condemnation on it for various issues. Um, the date on that has now expired to address that violation. And so unless that's addressed in the near future, that property will continue to go through, move through the process and it may come before city council for your consideration to uh, mitigate that property, which could be by demolition. Um, the staff is going to continue to work through these properties. I think we've got 12 to 14 hotel motel sites in the city. I think that's the rough number. And so we're on a schedule to visit all those. Um, quite frankly, the ones that are um, on the list that we've identified before will get visited probably uh, on the front end of that process versus some of the properties that have not historically been there. Um, but staff is, is back engaged on that. Um, we are concerned as we should be about what would occur for any of the residents who may be living in those properties long term. So city staff has engaged through the community development department with service providers. So if we're in a rehousing situation, spe specifically emergency rehousing, that we can have those resources made available. Um, at this point, we've not seen anything occur as far as anybody being removed or forced out of a room. But as that process moves forward, um, in the next 30 days, we could see or could hear of some of those instances. So um, staff is cognizant of that and does not want to see a, a lot of folks out on the street, but we have properties where you might have 10 to 15 rooms being occupied on a long-term basis. So we need to be ready to respond to those. Chairman, do you mind if I ask a couple questions? Sure. Okay. So, uh, so I like that timeline you said about 30 days. So, so do you think that like, like number one, identify how many folks are actually in a long-term situation in those hotels so we know what kind of numbers we're talking about? And then the one specifically on West Green, like I know just Monday we had that um, meeting about that fencing, you know, to allow that fencing. You know, the fencing down at that West Green, I mean, it's got the, you know, circular barbed wire. I mean, it, you're, you look like you're in a war zone. So is there any way that council could maybe come up with some ordinance that doesn't allow, like that doesn't allow them to be able to do that? And I don't even know if any of council members would want to, but I just, it just looks so terrible. To not allow Constantine terrible. wire? Huh? To not allow Constantine wire type fencing? I, I don't know. All I know is it looks really, really bad. And, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a corridor into our city as well. Sure. And I, I get lots and lots of complaints. I know that it's you know been uh, characterized as a hotspot with the crime and stuff too, and I just I I just so manager um, Ford, I'm sure Winston. I mean I'm, I'm sure other cities have this. So I know that we're not alone. It, are there some things that Winston were able to do in a hotel situation like that to make it go away? I mean just to either make them fix it or demolish it. Okay. Um, I will tell you the challenge that, that we're going to run into is one that's going to be the first time I think about is the same code you see in the list. Right, okay. Housing options. Um, because in, in many cases, we have to use that kind of thing in this report. Um, in terms of the aesthetics with the, um, the um, fencing that, that you're not right, uh, typically you can't make changes in your um, building to address that. So you have to, you have to offer services that 
Okay. And then also, I know several nonprofits in town, like Feeding Lisa's Kids. I used to do a lot with them. And a lot of times, Lisa will, like, post. Like, she'll find families that are living in that kind of situation. And they could stay somewhere nicer for a whole lot cheaper, but they don't have the... So I think that if we could identify those, I mean, maybe we could even uh, do a community-wide call for help. You know, like, and maybe some of these nonprofits, like, let's help these folks get in the housing. I th so anyway, I understand that that's the issue, and, and I hate it for the people that are living there because they could have so much of a better place and not have to live in, in that type of environment. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I hope we can see a change soon. <laughs> Sorry, don't mean to laugh. I got a question, Mr. Chair. Um, Let's go back. You said you, you know, after you've notified a, a hotel that you know they're in violation when it comes to uh, long stays, what is the penalty? Is it you start to find them and increasing the amount until they comply, or what, what do we? That do? is a fine-based process, and that is based on our zoning code. So the properties are, uh, as I recall, are zoned R1, which is not a long-term residential zoning district so it's not it's it's short-term hotel or motel use not long-term rental so what they're doing is they're using the property improperly as far as the zoning goes so the fine would go to the owner of the property as far as how they're operating it and there is a fine and it escalates and it'll get to five hundred dollars fairly quickly um, but what they would do to remedy is to make sure that they're not renting it long term so it should be a, a daily or a weekly type rental to comply with a hotel motel status not not a monthly rental it's a max of how many weeks i remember we were looking at this last year is it 30 days or is it two weeks as the maximum before it becomes a long term it was, there is a weekly rental component but i'm not sure that we have i don't i don't know the answer right off the top of my head as to how many weeks they can rent but it's not a month i know we were dealing with that <clears throat> one hotel that I told you just got sold. I don't know. Confirm that. Lori, do you happen to know by any chance? Just on the definition, um, one, most of you talk about one week as a time. Yes, for that. Um, and, I, and I'm going to probably, I'm just going to assume that if we were to try to do something with more teeth, that's a bigger conversation down the line instead of what we uh, could try to do now so far as no i think i think that's something we got to revisit but I, I think there's some tools and, and reggie may want to mention what those are as well but there's some commercial code tools that we might that we're looking at that could be helpful in the future and that would be more like something that we would do with a residential code right um well, there's some of those tools we don't have yet um i think the, the fire department's looking at some options for things where they currently can send violation notices but they don't have fines attached to them so they're looking to maybe beef up some of the the punitive provisions um so there's some tools that staff's evaluating that we may be bringing back for future consideration as well how soon though because I mean, we've got people begging us to fix these problems well i've been working with the manager so she's got a plan to kind of give us a manager briefing and kind of get something laid out so we can be good with council is that correct ma'am Councilman Peters, what's the, is that the hotel that next to Nick's sub shop is up? Well, uh, no, it's right there near, um, it's right there at the 85 intersection, right across from Mickey Truck Body. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You used to have a seat. But Nick, I mean, but Ernest does complain about that a lot because he drives by there right. every day to get to work. And I mean, they've seen nudity. I mean, the things that you see there is crazy. Now, I've never seen nudity or prostitution at that particular place, but it does look real, real sketchy. And, and like the barbed wire fencing, it just is terrible. The sign's all messed up. You can see the top of the roof and it looks terrible. It just looks really, really bad. And it's right there at the 85 intersection. 
Well, I'll say it's encouraging to know that the city is doing some enforcement to get those properties to fly straight and in conjunction with the briefing that the police chief gave. It yeah. sounds, I mean, I, I'm encouraged. Yeah, me too, absolutely. They're working on it, you know, it's no blind eye to it. So. Any other questions for staff on item 380? Uh, any other business to come before this committee? If not, then I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody.